Uh, okay. Um, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> uh, homemade warheads, indeed. We start this journey in the southeast, in the jungles of Mississippi, the forest of Mississippi, in um, simulated war games with real bullets, real guns, etc. Uh, and we end in the southeast of Europe in a very real conflict um, with a disparate band of people from everywhere. Their common, you know, the common currency is this, is the life of a soldier. But there's so many ways that you portray the reasons, the motivations, the desires and, and myths, the heroic myths that we all grow up with about what it means to be a soldier. So to start, can you talk a little bit, and in the meantime, you're covering half a dec half a century <laughs> of, of world history through the various conflicts that Gunther moves through and Carl moves through. Um, so talk a little bit about the structure of the film, how you found Gunther and Carl and decided that these two, you know, very disparate men um, had this seemingly, you know, a destined call in a way, um, how isolated they were. And then by seeing or, or chancing upon this idea of, of becoming a soldier, sort of sort of found their identity. Um, it was a little shakier than that, but if you would just start there, um, in terms of the approach and in terms of the structure and your personal obsessions <laughs> about about all of this. Hello. So um, at the beginning of the film uh, was the idea to portray. Uh, German who spent his time in the French Foreign Legion, and uh, this was the one thing. The other thing is that uh, I am a French citizen and I had to go to the French army. I was stationed in Germany at the time, it was still occupied country, mm -hmm. or not occupied country, but it was still allies in Western Germany. Um, and uh, that's why I had my military service in Germany because I was living in Munich at that time. So during my military service, I noticed about this German-French relationship and I learned about uh, many Germans being in French foreign Legion, especially after Second World War. So this was always something that interested me. And then during the military time, um, we were allowed to go to the PX of the American Army, which was close to uh, to our station, our regiment. And then I uh, read for the first time a, a magazine called Soldier of Fortune. Mm -hmm. It's a magazine from Boulder, Colorado, dealing with the world of mercenaries and military. And I went to Boulder and I asked if uh, they were willing to let me film them during the uh, I don't know, visits for one of their magazines in Karate mm -hmm. at that time. And the whole uh, concept ended the moment there was uh, the preparations for the war in Iraq. Because this was the biggest, um, how do you say, deployment, deployment of uh, US forces since Vietnam. And then they were focusing on, let's say, every capacity they had to go there. So there was no uh, interest for them at that time to go to Middle America. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this declined. And then um, I said, OK, what can I do? And I contacted the German. A uh, journalist who was covering the civil war in Rhodesia. And he told 
me of uh, an acquaintance he had in Liverpool, which is Carl. And uh, we met Carl in Liverpool. And at that time, I learned that he was uh, going to Suriname because there was this civil war in Suriname, and they were fighting for the rebel group against the government in Suriname. And I, there were meetings in Holland, too, in the Netherlands, I think in Timbuk, with some of the people. And this was quite interesting because it matched the biography of uh, Aschenbrenner, who mm -hmm. was stationed in Guyana. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, April 91, we went to Guyana, hoping that Karl would also go to Suriname and that we could move from French Guyana to Suriname to meet him and his group. And uh, he didn't came, didn't come, didn't appear, we called every day. So we didn't know what to do. And then in summer 91, a war started in Europe again. And uh, soon after that, uh, Karl had the first trip to Zagreb to mm -hmm. check out if there would be a job for him. And then in December 91, it was clear that uh, he had his position and that uh, we could join him in Croatia. Mm -hmm. So that's why we went to Croatia and finished the real aspect of war um. in our uh, continent in South, <laughs> South America. So that's a bit the concept of uh, the structure of uh, this, this film. Uh, now to the characters. Um, in order to get um, this uh, protagonist from the Legion, I put an ad in a paper in Munich and in Hamburg that I was looking for a legionnaire and mercenary for a film project. Mm -hmm. And it was the wife of Günther Schumann who called me. I met also other people also in Hamburg, but uh, he was, let's say, person who was the highest ranking and he was an elite in the French Legion as a parachutist and also he was very, uh, uh, how do you say, the way he was talking was quite unusual from what you might have thought how they would talk <laughs> and he was not uh, showing off like many others mm -hmm. so there were many reasons why I said, okay, he's a perfect person to stick with. And uh, well, the same was uh, Karl, who was a different character, but who was, well, we got along, and he was the way he was. Yeah? So, complete different personality, uh, let's say, like a more open book, showing more his vulnerability. Uh, Vulnerabilities. Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was clear that he was a different person. Mm -hmm. So that they would contrast to each other. Mm -hmm. Also a little bit like he's describing it. You have the structure of the legion, which is part of the ordinary French army. Mm -hmm. And then you have like solitaires, mm -hmm. dogs of war, you could call them. Right looking for opportunities. The, the way in which they story tell, there is this, um, this way in which they really beautifully describe the, when they're, when they're willing to follow, when they're willing to lead, and when they're also willing to concede that they really there are forces so much larger, things that are going on, things change, you make adjustments, you know, this this way in which the, um, the personality of the soldier is so malleable, in a sense. But then you have here two men, I mean, what's so beautiful about that portraiture is you have two men who really know what they're about um, and have consciously made 
you know, a decision to be a career soldier and the way in which they speak about the community, that comradeship, um, that becomes vital actually to their very existence, to their survival, that surpasses almost everything. Um, I mean, going back to your own experience as a constricted, constricted, and scripted, there we go, soldier, um, what were your personal feelings in that regard, or what were your observations about your your fellow conscripts around you? I mean, were there various ways in which people survived? Because there are personalities that flourish in this environment, and as Luther talked about specifically, there are people who move into this world knowing really quite consciously that it's going to destroy them in a sense. I find that psychology really hard to understand. Yes, it is uh, definitely hard to understand, but um, uh, maybe what is interesting, uh, in 92 there was a world premiere of the film Locano, mm -hmm. and Kuntashen uh, Brenner and his wife, they came to and uh, at the world premiere, the wife told me that also his third brother was also in the French region. So there was a third? A third, a third brother. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and this was quite interesting because he never told me about it. He never told me about this second brother, so of whom I learned in, in French Guiana, and then the wife told me there was also a third one. So, I don't know what happened or what was exactly happening in the family so that they decided that this would be a good option for their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the same goes for, for Karl, who has a different approach to it, but um, I think, let's say, from a uh, point of view of someone living in Germany, uh, where everything dealing with military, let's say, in the post-war society is very uh, neglected. We have an army, or there is an army in Germany since the 50s, but you will hardly find any fiction films or documentaries where you have a military as a principal character, something that is common in the US. Uh, popular cinema. Mm -hmm. Is, yeah. is so that a direct so legacy? Yes, as, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, and until um, the Iraq War in 91, the Germans, or the majority of Germans, always thought that we could stay out of everything. Mm -hmm. yeah? So, just be in an observation position. But this change, I'd say, with, uh, uh, of course, the Balkan War in 91 and so on. Um, but it has always been a big debate. So, for me, it was interesting to see how normal it could be for British to be in the British Army. It's like a job. Yeah. And obviously, for many people in, let's say, in Europe, after the uh, revolt in Hungary in 56, 57, after the war, Fell, there were always people going to the French uh, region after these incidents in Europe. So mm, people search for kind of stability they can't find in our society. So you can say that everybody who doesn't see this as an option should be lucky to mm. find a different way to get stability in our society instead of going, yeah, I hope you know, is clear what I mean? Let's say, I cannot, I don't want to look asymmetrically on those people. Yeah. Because I can say, I'm happy that I don't have to go to these, or I, I don't have to choose these options, which obviously they didn't have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, previous to this film, you, you had made several films about groups of men, in particular, 
who come together uh, in, okay, maybe from the outside in very strange circumstances, you know, they, but they have this commonality and they form, you know, their own type of stability, let's say. But it's, um, it is outside of society. It is, in a way, rejecting um, the stability or what passes for stability in in normal everyday discourse in in say Germany in particular. Um, so, in a sense, this 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 family group. I mean, this I I, I really kept coming back to this way in which these structures, however they are, self-imposed or otherwise, seem to be providing something that for, is it missing for everybody? And these men decide to seek it out in their own way? Or is it something that's, that's missing in them in particular? I mean, I'm just curious to know your opinion about that because... Well, I, 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 German society is, is, <laughs> is, is, is very conformist for a variety of reasons. Um, yes, but uh, um, well, first of all, I think uh, a key could be uh, more the elitist thinking. Uh, you have a military elite, you have an economic elite, you have uh, elites in society that come out of universities, for example. So. And uh, they all work in the same manner. Right. You, you are together and then you form codes. They could be uh, uniform, it could be a sign, a badge, a code of honor, whatever. So these, these terms function in, let's say, many Western countries and even, I think, in non-Western countries. You have this pattern of or the matrix of elites that works. Some are more lethal, okay, but the others are more intellectual or spiritual or whatever, but it exists. And uh, yeah, I, I don't want to say too much about myself or how I see it. It's just, uh, I think they give so much of themselves to us by explaining what they do and how they did it. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's say what I recognize today is that it's uh, interesting how to talk about it, how they talk about it, even let's say with, uh, uh, with Karl, uh, right in the situation of things happening. Um, this is something which is uh, quite amazing how he's doing yeah. it. Uh, so war is, let's say war is a topic it's always a situation where you talk or where you remember something. You know? Remembrance of war is imminent to war. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. so this is quite interesting what I learned today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the <laughs> way you're, you're filming a lot too, though, the, the trappings as well, the ceremonies mm -hmm. and the various... Um, yes. You know, group. Um, it, it's it's almost. I mean, in the end, we are in an actual church service, but in the barracks as well, when they're together um, and they're reminiscing, and uh, there is this this upliftment, in a sense, um, in that remembrance, um, which was probably. I mean, is it an overly romanticized version that needs to gloss over the reality? <laughs> because from Gunter, we learned that there were, and also from Carl, you know, there are um, sort of devastatingly frightening incidences that these men live through, and they speak about that automatic way of moving through those traumas and only after it's over can they really process it. And it's something for me that's that's really fascinating about human psychology, how one part of the brain can shut down and and something else takes over, almost an animal instinct takes over. 
Um, and and so by by filming these sort of ceremonial um, episodes, you know, what what did you feel in in those moments, uh, if you can remember, or rewatching it again after so long, um, that that sort of fed into this whole idea of, you know, I mean, I think about the title Warheads. Mm-hmm. It's like it's in the head. It's it's part and parcel of who they are. Yeah, it's a, well, it's a, it's a film about the uh, verbalization of uh, war, although it's happening in the blood, yeah, in the same time, especially uh, in the Croatian part. Yeah. Um, and um, there is uh, something I learned out of this technique is uh, the, the images behind the word, I would call it. And uh, in the, the film was from 93 and in 95, I made a fiction film on a serial killer in Germany called uh, Fritz Hamann, which <coughs> was, uh, who was um, part of the, um, let's say, a big part of this character became the role of uh, Peter Lohmann and Alfred Slam. So, and in the film I made, I, I filmed a psychiatric uh, examination of the serial killer by a professor of psychiatry on Gottingen in 24, 25. And uh, there were no flashbacks, so it was just explaining how he killed the, uh, the, the persons, the, the boys. So it was just what I say, uh, the images behind the words. Mm-hmm. And this is exactly uh, what is so interesting about uh, Aschenbrenner that he has a cap- capability to explain in plastic terms. So especially when you uh, remember um, his explanation of uh, the atomic bomb when he watched. And you can really see the atomic mushroom in front of your eyes, but you don't see it in the film. So, um, and then the same goes with, um, with, with uh, Karl, who is also able to find plastic words. Also, he prefers to, let's say, the work of uh, James Nachbar, because I had a book yeah. of John, uh, James Nachbar at home, mm-hmm. and uh, the interview was shot in my kitchen in Munich. On his way from Liverpool to Zagreb, they stopped over in and so he's also finding images like the whirlpool where he's drowning or will drown soon or whatever. So it is uh, interesting to observe how they Im- imagineize their memory in front of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there must be a uh, let's say, percentage of romanticizing things. Yeah. And this goes to the history of his father, right, Aschenbrenner. Let's say, don't get drawn, when you're drawn to the army, you are not drawn to the SS. You, you go on purpose into the SS. But for him, his father was also drawn to the SS. Yeah. Uh, so all these things, um, let's say the Butch and Algier, or also what came to my mind today was uh, the Jewish connotation of the woman who married his brother and who is a dragon. So I was wondering if this is an anti-Semitic reflex that survived in the French Foreign Legion because there were so many Germans from war time entering uh, the French mm-hmm. Legion. So these are things that you can yeah. notice. Yeah. No, it's it's very interesting too, and and the the, tr- the transformation of the name yes. as well. Yes. You know, which is. Um, I mean, it's kind of glossed over in this the way he's storytelling in a very casual way, yes. as if it's kind of funny. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's something very profound in that, because of course many Jews, you know, 
did change their identities and did change their names for a very different reason purpose but it was to assimilate it was to not be different mm -hmm. um, and so yeah that scene is very poignant in a sense mm -hmm. because it's almost like he's in a way discovering that anew mm -hmm. when he's talking about it um, in a sense unless it's something that's been suppressed for so long and then you know, brought out in this sort of comradely conversation where it's safe to talk about these things in a casual way. Um, but um, I want to talk a little bit about the presence of the camera. Um, in the one-on-one -on -one where, you know, you're obviously we can hear you, it's a discussion. Um, but in those, in those moments when you're filming in, in Mississippi, for instance, I, I had the distinct feeling that there was such appreciation, in a sense, on the part of that group being documented mm -hmm. in that way. And the same in the very real conflict in Croatia, where they are playing distinctly to the camera. Yeah. Um, and it's excited, that's another level of excitement and another level of urgency that a camera crew is in the forest with them, running, you know, jockeying for position, trying to get that shot, you know, where it feels as real as possible, whether it's simulated or whether it's real, real. Yes. Um, I found that really fascinating. Um, can you talk, did you notice that at the time? <coughs> Um, yes, I mean, the tape was, um, it's now 26 years or 27 years, yeah. So it was a distance of 27 years and, uh, for example, I just finished a shoot in the zoo of Zurich. I've been there for over a year and I started the project in the zoo of Berlin, but I couldn't finish the film because they were from the zoo, although they allowed me to film in the zoo, they were, let's say, obstructing my work. And then I had to leave because I couldn't continue there. And then I found another top zoo in Europe, and this was Zoo Zurich, and they allowed me to film. I had big difficulties, although they were always supporting me. The uh, Department of Communication, uh, the director of the zoo, so, but the people, they were worried if I filmed them during their working time, if this would be well received, badly received, if they are performing well. So the whole concept of presence of camera is completely out of boundaries. So it is in a way strange to say that it was easier to film with mercenaries than with employees of the zoo. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, but this is also the time in between which changed the uh, so-called knowledge of camera work because people think today more than ever that they know how film is made, what the camera is, but in, in fact they don't know more than before. And there they were more at this time in, in the mercenary field, they were reflecting the presence of the camera sometimes, but they were more with themselves, much, much more with themselves. Yeah? They were making a peace sign or making a joke or looking at it. But today, everybody is looking at the camera. Mm -hmm. Everybody is checking in front of the camera what I'm doing with the camera. So it's nearly impossible to film, let's say, a scene in a zoo where people just pass by. It's impossible to film. Everybody will walk and uh, look in the camera make a gesture, even young people, they think it's a live uh, broadcast right. from television and then they will stand in front and do things and so on. So it's really uh, strange how this developed. 
and um, yeah, and it's interesting to observe the little, um, I say the little uh, spikes of the camera is present in this film, and uh, this is something I was always accepting. Let's say someone like Weisman, he would all he would uh, delete all these yeah. spikes until today he's doing it. But in the French cinema vérité, like the Padon or people like him, they always accept the presence of the camera in order to say that we are not super objective, mm -hmm. which doesn't exist at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so we are, and it's, you, you must know, we were living in the same apartment as the mercenaries because there was no hotel and there was no other place where we could stay. So when you, as a film team, you sleep in the same place as the mercenaries, you cannot make a, a kind of objectiveness. You are here and you have to show that you are part of this environment. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we accept what they do or how they think, but you cannot neglect yourself, it's impossible. Right. But I mean, this was what was so moving then about, <coughs> if we can call the performances, yes. right, mm -hmm. of, of Karl and Gunther, mm -hmm. because um, there was um, an innate understanding there, um, but also a movement, mm -hmm. you know, between the person, the people behind the camera and the people in front, and I, I, I deeply empathize with documentary filmmakers of today because what you're talking about is so palpable mm -hmm. and such an issue when, you know, these whole discussions of, of you know, hybrid mm -hmm. um, and, and mixed reality or, you know, there's so many terms about this kind of, you know, non-fiction cinema. But again, I think this film shows that, that I don't know that innocence, in a way, um, be, between the maker and the protagonist. You know that it is a sort of a venture together um, that is that is missing a lot. Um, you know, in in today's nonfiction cinema. Yeah, it's a it's a it's an issue of trust. Yeah. Um, you know, at that time, it's not obvious that the mercenary or mercenary tells you about his life. It's not, and I met other mercenaries, you know, the first meeting they would uh, tell or describe how they uh, fucked a, a whore in Djibouti or something, you know, so, or in wherever. So they were really uh, <laughs> spreading out all, everything they had. There was no, no, no filter. Yeah. And this is uh, difficult to to use in terms of cinema. I think sometimes it is part of fictionalized cinema, but I don't know. I think for me it was not the way to do it. Um, and well, so. and you must uh, know maybe also that. It was very difficult to make this film in Germany uh, because at that time it was not common to be interested in persons like that. Uh, and let's say at the Berlin Film Fund, I had to drive there and I, I was tested. You know, I had a, they checked me morally. If I was, let's say, pro or contra or what person I was, mm -hmm. in order to be interested in things like that, mm -hmm. because and, uh, there was a television uh, editor who was very famous for, uh, even for the new German cinema, and he said, oh no, we don't want to give you money for this film because we know what they will say. This was the attitude. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a very asymmetric 
attitude towards people on the border, but these people from the border are more in the center of society than persons who think they are in the center of society. They know what is good, and what should be shown, what should people right. think, and should people see about this topic, which is present to German history, even Second World War, of course, but until today. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is uh, also very important to understand uh, the film. And you mentioned uh, the films I did before. I made a film on, uh, for example, pit bull owners in the Hamburg pimp scene. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the 80s, it was very fashionable for pimps to have pit bulls from the US mm -hmm. and even to import them. It was like a symbol of Onyx and things yeah. like that. So we made these films and people were worried and why is he so fascinated with violence and uh, more uh, female journalists were happy about these films because they thought I would ridiculize men by portraying them because it was a complete strange attitude towards it. So it was difficult to make a film like that, but when it was shown in Locarno especially, then in Berlinale in 93, it was a change that people understood, but still uh, some official boards said you know, they rejected to give a uh, certificate so that we can uh, save taxes in the cinema. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a film like Rambo, got this certificate, but right. this film was rejected by five to zero because they thought this is not the way to make a film on mercenaries, it doesn't help for discussions on this topic and I am naive because I let them talk. You know, these issues are part of the project. Well, I'm glad you persevered. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. Yes. Um, but thank you so much for this film and for your incredible body of work. Um, I'm sorry, we didn't have more time to talk. Thank you also for staying this afternoon. Thank you.